The Vanity of Australian Wishes. One, thank you, dear sir, for making that your request to me, which I make my pride, nay, my duty, that I should continue my disdain and abhorrence of vice and manifest it still in my writings. I would indeed do it with more restrictions and less personally. It is more agreeable to my nature, which those who know it are not greatly mistaken in. But general satire in times of general vice is no force and is no punishment. People have ceased to be ashamed of it when so many are joined with them. And it is only by hunting one or two from the herd that any examples can be made. If a man writ all his life against the collective body of the bandity or against lawyers, would it do the least good or lessen the body? But if some are hung up or pilloried, it may prevent others. And in my low station... With no other power than this, I hope to deter, if not reform. 4. Alexander Pope to Dr Arbuthnot, 2nd of August, 1734. He's a fucking Lulu. If you smash five pool cues and an iron bar over someone's head, you're a fucking Lulu. Jason Moran on Alphonse Gagetano, Melbourne, the late 1990s. The afternoon they buried Alphonse Gagetano, John Forbes died. The first had the slight ability to be a sometime charmer, but finished as an over-underachieving Ligon Street Lulu, whose killing kick-started a decade-plus of Melburnium mayhem and, ultimately, its miniseries. John, at 14, intending to be a poet, told himself how that would be the finest way to spend a lifetime. And we are glad he did. He was our conscience, the voice announcing, near enough isn't even remotely near enough, or poet to poet, the even better, it's fucked, mate. Ignorance is truth, small beer careerism, the not just bad, but the irredeemably tin ear bad. Poets have always had a special category potential for their Lulu moments. But at least you weren't that thug with iron bar and pool cues losing in some pretentiously titled King Street Gentleman's Club. So Lulu, so total, Jason and the Munster headed out to Templestow, making sure your moments, Lulu or otherwise, would cease. Oh, Gangetana so needing us to pretend you were our De Niro. No mere gangster, but the movie star who, on those occasions when paid to, pretends he is one. Though when one imitates the imitations, just how many deluded layers is that? Whilst around the time you... In all your standover glory, swaggered Carlton, a re, re, re enamoured Forbes coined the kids in black. For those scions of cultural theory he thought were taking over just about the lot. Who now do what? Watch yet another actor play at Gadgetano, play at De Niro, play at, well, whoever, whatever you were and did. Your living as your dying was hardly poetry. For after any discourse, let alone narrative, here is where the realisation lands. Who notices the cover bands, cover bands? Not so the one who died the day they buried Alphonse the other. 
And with all that galaxy of an intellect swamped by an overloaded body, it had to take both John and us a funeral, a memorial service, and three wakes to adjust, if we ever did. Two. Why should any world styling itself new, let alone such hyper-new antipodes as ours, reckon it owns a mortgage on tolerance and reason? That special unto itself belief that we're the ones never stuffing it. And when all we're was shown as substance having been picked spun, woven and worn flakes off to even less than fog, why then must we take for our model some fat man in the TAB forever blaming bludger horses when mateys we bet nags don't. This is your captain speaking and name us a better way to start a vanity of wishes. Well, there's quite a few. Talent aside, they commenced it so much better. Those whose audience had to imagine the scope of the world as known, as was being known. When a poet took risks applying the wishes of Cadiz to those by the Ganges. But a few could prove him correct. Fewer could prove him wrong. And having to imagine, they believed. Having to believe, they imagined. And maybe when an aircraft seems to distill not merely time and space, but where you're heading and what you're heading to, the novelty, the romance, the deal, the con, the climax, a start of it, an end to it. Maybe belief, let alone imagination, is redundant. Think, though, of those gods whose desires are set to stymie our desires. Or even those other more benign gods, wishing to ensure our rewards. You'll realise all lives are still based on the very same hopes, all petitions on the very same trust. What might happen still might happen, if only swifter, meaning what? More time to choose, more ways to fool yourself, yourselves and the world. Which is why your captain, however imaginary, is speaking. You there, flying to meet your new lover for the first time, no matter what you've read, heard and seen of her, or what she has of you, there's still your pit of the stomach to consider. Wishes are no more newer than they ever were, than they are now. Look down, look down on this autumn afternoon. Parked beside some riverina footy oval, there just might be a man looking up, sharing your apprehension. Or else he might be thinking, more folk, more time, more choice, and more mock visionaries asking us to believe in them and the overreachings of the past three, four, five, six thousand years just polished with today's new spit. Whilst here, in the cavern across the aisle, there's somebody else, one you'd love to identify. Certain he must be a former playground legend. What year, what playground doesn't matter? when all wishes and anti-wishes kept simmering at their optimum. Swaggering was at its most ludicrous, cringing its most pathetic, naivety its most believable. Not that he looks or looked remotely braggart, cowed or sheer gormless, but loving to know who he was and what he did, you probably never will. And though an airline's discretion means they won't announce, have a guess who's on this flight, on mine, this one focused for you, I'm allowed a leeway, even if with most you don't know them, have never heard of them, they're still recognisable. Three. 
Now, if you're the kind who dozes on the long hauls, here's something you can dream on. Remember that wide-eyed, sadly banal kid? The one who knew every word of lucky stars, I've been everywhere? All high schools must have had one. Him with just a sullen, moon-faced pom for a friend, correct? Well, let your dream unfold to this. It's been years since the sewerage had arrived, but still his old man won't pull down the decommissioned dunny. So you ask, why? Because, explains the boy, it's where we store the briquettes and the wood. Practical, eh? Yep. He replies to no one but himself, consumed with such simplicity and pride, reckon it is, especially when, his eyes are bulging, it's barbecue time. And when it is, that boy with his one meagre novelty talent, that 14-year-old wonder boy, will stand on the back steps jabbering to all the grown-ups how he's been everywhere, man. Son and dad, almost in trances, shameless yet innocent, believing him to be, allow their trance to call it, forging something of himself. Or else you're back in grade five, my grade five, Mrs Sampson's, where, with all her widow's autocracy, she still allows us an awe-filled, artful access to her tragedies and what they've taught her. How to line up ten-year-olds, how everyone must understand what they're becoming since she's seen us all in these Australian rows. First, those kids, they've always got the jump on anybody, with smarties in their play lunch. Then those who want to be them, those who want to be their friends, who want to beat them up, who want to beat up those who want to beat them up, and then the very worst, the theorists, the ideologues, those who urge the beatings, all the beatings. Now go up a grade to find yourself so captivated, so horrified by Mr Kavanagh's witty, shell-shocked charisma, a loud and canny, tender-hearted brute given to yarns in bush hyperbole, to twirling and then lighting up his roll-your-owns. How it now amuses him to round in on the smokers. Aha, the smokers, who thought somehow they'd outwit Cav. <laughs> Not that they didn't return from lunch plain stinking of the stuff. For a sillier pathos, name a better one than ten, eleven, twelve-year-olds puffing. Cav has some lollies, see, designed to quit his smoking, not that it has, and experiments, giving one to an inoffensive boy who wouldn't know what a cigarette was, and it tastes fine. Then one each to the smokers, and how they squirm. So us, Cav, what's it like deep inside the guts, eh, fellas? And we'll meet these squirming mannequins again, won't we? That snowy there, though doubtless he'll turn out some Sir but, Sir but, it's an Australian dobber. Him with some of his dumber mates, all with their lessons to be received. Four. Not much learning, though. Just name it. We'll fall for it. Since this land is mate land, where, if belief is all, and no ifs, it is, here's a who of whom among the mate land pride I'll be testing that belief for you. A multi-substance sports star. Some XX would be, would be supermodel. A very former CEO turned opinion piecer. 
and some bankrupted motivational speaker poised at the edge of the slammer. Plus big noter, small timer, I am if you are and you better be, ha ha ha, bag man, slag man, liar, thief. 30, 40, 50 years on from 6A, our very own self-proclaimed king of the rooters, Snowy. You don't remember him? Or I have that wrong, you'd rather forget him, right? But how can you when Maitland's his land, the home of Snowy in the pub, him of the year, my year, unending chook raffle, who, stranding his very close personal friends mid-shout, there's of course, runs off with both the takings and the chook. Still, I assume there remains some cheek in it, some hardly knowing you've done it until you've done it cunning which, for conclusion, requires this dead plus easy two-step. One, keep the little lady well on side, buy her some Chanel or near enough. Two, both tuck into the yummo raffle, a.k.a. chook laundering. But let's pause to reconsider the closing moments in the career of, you should remember him, the former leader. And doesn't this phrase give one mighty pause to go, yes, that former leader, Snow Snow's mate, still with the need to court the men whose friend he wishes to be, kids with smarties, the battler billionaires and their applause. How'd he do it? The only way he knew, yap, yap, yap. Till, with their collective sigh of better things to do, in salty, honest, a battler billionaire speak, the demand came. Won't this cocksucker ever stop? And you couldn't blame them. Not that he heard them. He was off finishing public life as he truly wished it, playing some kind of Midwest Republican governor transplanted to the South Pacific. Which may be a cheap shot, but not because it isn't true. If I'd relied on such a living footnote to validate my efforts, even for an hour, I'd be as cheap as he became. Besides, I've readers needing entertainment. And since what's worse than any successful con must be a failed one, I'd like to introduce the Barley Nine. Vaguely aspirational, debt-ridden young adults out of service and hospitality. With little knowledge of Asia, except as some holiday destination, and none of history. Dupes of some near enough, feels good enough scheme, whereby they'll receive their pittance, helping others to turn rich and continue richer. Now without access to all their slop culture, doubtless going through some Barley Nine brand of withdrawal, mate, when smart flips to stupid, it flips that quick, so that they're turning to the Bible, or God really help us, motivational speakers. But wait, now things have surely altered, for we're hearing not, if I can, you can, But if I can, you cannot. That's right, cannot. Not now. Not when you're the Barley Nine, all served up as some prime time reality soapy. Was anything more representative of Howard's Oz, of Snowy's Maitland? And they can forget what's popping up on any screen For where's their social networking now, eh, Snow? No, I'll get you a network. We'll seek out the underworld. Though, first, please ask, are you by any chance the underworld? And yeah. Five. Well before beer became boutiqued, when wine was for winos, wine dots, some women and certain questionable men, 
when there were big, big wash tubs of Vic Melbourne Fosters, and for those styling themselves attached to the side, Abbots, then and there you're hearing from outside on the back porch steps a kind of recital sounding special, sounding truly Aussie. What though? I don't know. Some imitation race call? Not quite. You must remember the Wonder Boy, that dull and simple crowd pleaser with his old man grinning, panting there beside him. <laughs> Whilst below, amongst the grown-ups, with all of his skewed vanity there behind the con, Snowy's watching, watching the boy and everyone, watching and waiting. Oh, out of all this, real dills are emerging and there's little better. Not only do they believe it, they want to believe it. Want to believe it again, yet again, yet again. And how does Snowy know? Because Australia, since the first fleet, he's been everywhere. Snowy on the goldfields, jumping everyone else's claims. Snowy on the board of Stanhill, of Rothwells, of Quintex, Futurex, Stubbs Corp and Boomcon, of Hardy's, of Firepower. Snowy as well as a sex engine rootin' for all his life, not theirs. Peggy Berman, Shirley Briffman, Diane Brimble, Shirley Finn. Smug Snowy with his play lunch smarties. Bitter Snowy without any play lunch smarties. Even angrier expat Snowy returning out of some 30, 40, 50 year time warp to give a keynote, receive an honorary, telling us how ashamed we've made him, her, reckoning we're laughing stock and guess who leads the laughter. Or as evangelist committing generations to the Lord Jesus Snowy. Fall for me? Sure you fall for me. Fall for the skew, the vanity, the con, the all. Or ask his digger mates. They'll tell you about him. Desert Rat Snowy on the Burma Railway, or was it in Changi, Kokoda, the Battle of Brisbane? Why not Lennon's Saloon Bar, an entire stoush? I'm not moving, mate. I'm permanent. Six. Sure are. By now it's 1949, and something we are told is wrong. Soon churchmen, lawmen, will deliver their wishes, their vanities, their call to Australia, more than hinting at degenerates, white anters. Something is causing harm, moral harm, which isn't them, this brotherhood of who knows best. Then there's that Sheila, who knows the best, the very best way to get her man of the moment is through his needs. Needs he never knew would be as good as what she's promising. Laneway, back seat, room in some anon hotel. He can't believe how quick this Sheila's been. And yet he has to. Has to, for he wants to. Won't even ask, might there be more to this? Given what she wants, there won't be any need, will there? Don't have to ask, she likes me, right? Oh, right. He trusts her. Isn't that enough? Trusts her till he has to trust that pounding on the door much more and the hoon in Gabardine scowling there with backup mate who's misses. One more dag was almost set to root. Put your tool away right away and pay, pay, pay. That chum was the badger game. Now here's the variant. A one-time exotic dancer, her bludger, and some new mate they've picked up at the races. Andrews, Clayton 
and Jean Lee, plus their final badger, Pop Kent, SP Bookie, Elderly, Perv. So imagine this. It's wowser time in Carlton. Pre-Gangitano, pre the bulk of us. And they're in some bar, the four of them. She and Pop are flirting, but silly girl, silly all of them, she's writing out Velez, her dancing name. Soon they'll be back in Pop Kent's room. Back for his SP hundreds and thousands, which, if they do exist, he won't give up. Good evening. Here is the news. Today they played their final Badger game. And he died carrying her name. They're caught that night. Next year, they're hanged. Which makes it all a ripe crime for wowsers, right? Not quite. Ripe for every one of us at any time to shake our heads saying you wouldn't read about it. But we do. Setting up pop for a last good route who hasn't had the remotest cash they think he has. Certain tortures only to be hinted at. And when they've belted him dead, that bludger uselessness in getting caught. Knowing you and your call to Australia, sure you weren't there in the bar, in the room, in the court at the gallows, bet you would have loved to have been, eh, Snowy? Such a great story, such a hideous story, and know their tragedy. After they were sentenced, no one gave us stuff. Seven. And still it seems there's some disease out there, vain, wishful and Australian. For despite all... All the joy their Oz celeb status has brought us. Weren't you promised earlier they'd be on the flight? Digger and Vroom Vroom and AK and Chad have just been sacked. Digger won. Oh, he always won. But once he'd left the ground, showered, changed and drove away, he still believed it. Had to. That's where and when certain mates arrived. Mates in rehab. He once escorted Vroom Vroom to the brown lab but got so out of it some mate took her home. The mate's home. Made a splash that night, Vroomy did. Another at the cup. In her funny hat and little else. Once, half a decade's fame ago, the catwalk's closed. She never quite made it to Milan. Most days now really makes it out of bed and gets wrong thoughts. AK, aka Annabelle Kate, still receives right thoughts. She has to. Certain people need to know this ex.